I might have broken the rules a little bit in terms of keeping to the topic, but um, and I won't be giving necessary this morning uh, exact details of the retrofit pro projects from a construction point of view. But don't worry, because um, it's just taking you to a different place to the nuts and bolts that we've been obviously li listening to uh, first thing. Um, and I'll tell you why I've gone off piece a little bit um, from, and I apologise. <laughs> so um, I'm going to concentrate on explaining why our practice Native Architects uses natural materials uh, and we minimise, not exclude, but we minimise technology in our design. Uh, and then I'm going to go on to, to show you some research we carried out a couple of years ago with the University of York. Um, so in Yorkshire, Native Architects are unique with the expertise we have combining the use of natural materials and other forms <coughs> of um, sustainable construction. And what happened was, um, I set this practice up in 1997, and in 2000, we joined the Green Register. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Green Register, but it was set up by a lady called Lucy Pedler uh, as part of her lifelong commitment, and mine, to the promotion of sustainable building. So we were one of the first practices in the region to become trained retrofitters of traditional buildings, of course, and we also trained in the design of specifying low carbon technologies. So I qualified in 1980, which is sort of 40-ish years ago. So I really shouldn't be here. Someone younger than me should probably be here. But because I'm still so passionate, I'm you know, here on my crutches and I've, I've come along to fire you all up in this, um, because I, I feel that's my role now, is to help inspire people. Uh, and as I've done it for such a long time, I mean, I'm not a scientist or, I, you know, I don't know the answers to it all, but hopefully I can point the way. So because I'm so passionate about learning and education, I returned to the classroom in 2012. And the reason I did that was because all of my professional career, I had never had formal conservation qualifications. And that's really important today to have that formal recognition of your skills. Um, and so in 2013, I gained my master's in buildings archaeology at the University of York, and I made a lot of friends uh, and connections there. Um, and I was accredited in 20, um, 2013 as a RIBA conservation architect. So all I'm saying is to you, you can trust me. You know, I know what I'm doing, and I don't know it all, but I've got a lot of passion, I've got a lot of knowledge, and I want to make it work for York, because all of my professional career has been in York. I wasn't born in Yorkshire, I'm a southerner, um, but I'm now adopted, of course, very kind people. Um, but um, I believe that the pairing of natural building materials um, with the repair of historic buildings is a very compatible solution. Um, you know here that using some mainstream materials will harm historic fabric and none of us want to do that uh, and speed up deterioration. So our practice ethos is to avoid harmful materials where we can, such as concrete and plastic. And the results of this method are considerable and I'll show you some of that later. And as you were referring to, you know, the unintended consequences, which is a great, you know, strap line, unintended consequence of using plastic in buildings, particularly in insulation, is something you can't see happening. Um, I apologise for the, um, the words. There are lots of pictures later, but if you can just bear with me on these first few sli slides with the words. So um, our ethos is to improve the environment through design. I mean, one, using natural materials is only one way, but it makes your buildings low carbon by default. And the retention of existing fabric will retain the embedded carbon in it. So just a little um, example of the opposite to our approach. It can be illustrated um, in the recent demolition of the unfashionable but perfectly sound Hudson House, where I spent my formative um, 12 years of my career at working for British Rail. So... You know, as you, those of you who live in York know, they, they knocked down a very ugly and unfashionable building, but the amount of carbon that was embedded in that building was lost. And they built houses on that site, which could have very easily been 
built inside the existing building. Um, so that is not a sustainable solution to lose buildings in that way. Um, and it's definitely not part of the net zero aspiration that this conference is all about. Um, so um, our approach um, is fabric first at last. Why? Why we're we doing it? You know, low tech design is sustainable. And basically what it's leading to is less energy being used. So however much... Uh, and I, I, I say I'm not, I'm not a naysayer of technology, but fabric first, stopping that fabric um, from losing the heat and using less energy has to be the starting point. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, bit of, you know, I'm a knowledge freak, and it is all about the knowledge, and, and, and that, that's what it's all about. And um, we're a member of two organisations, the ASBP, which is the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. Now, the ASBP, um, they champion the understanding and use of demonstrably sustainable building products. But the AECB, whose, um, whose words I've stolen here on this slide, um, is an association for environment conscious building. It's the leading network for the sustainable building professionals in the UK. And members of the AECB include local authorities, housing associations, builders, architects, designers, and consultants. So some of the words will stop here. But, um, basically, what I want to say to you is that we're doing it. I'm doing it because I want to be a part of the change to better our lives, as well as others in the planet. The planet's obviously up here. Um, but through comfort, health, and sustainability in our homes and workplaces. So, um, first of all, I'm just going to show you three case studies which represent some of our work using sustainable forms of building construction. Um, three, just three. I mean, we do work throughout the region. In the city centre, we have a, you know, a, a huge um, number of projects um, where we've had to work with conservation officers, the planners, etc. So we're very familiar with working in the city. Um, but I'm going to show you um, three case studies today. One is a new, a new build straw bale house. The second case study is the renovation of a listed cottage. And the third case study is a new leisure building and conversion of listed barns that were on the site. Okay, so th the first case study is a straw bale house. Interestingly, the client who built this uh, decided to build a straw bale house because the client suffered terribly with asthma and she was looking to create an indoor um, environment that was not going to antagonize her breathing. And I'll talk about this um, later this afternoon if you want to come and, and talk at the stand, but um, their ambitions were amazing. Um, the aesthetics of the building weren't necessarily what we might have gone for. They wanted the sort of French chateau look with little flicked out eaves. Um, but it was, um, it, it was a great aspiration. And uh, we have built straw bale houses elsewhere. So this house is in Rydale, North Yorkshire, 10 miles northeast of York. Load bearing load-bearing small bale structure, which is very easy to do. I can lift up a bale and put it on the frame. Um, it's um, got lime plaster inside and lime render outside. So this is just to illustrate some of the range of buildings we do. Um, this project um, is in a village um, called Tolleton um, in Hambleton district. Uh, it's four miles south of Easingwall, 10 miles north of York. And this was a listed cottage um, where we had quite um, a typical uh, process of gaining consent for the work we did. But the major part of it was a large extension to the rear. Um, we had to demonstrate that we weren't causing harm to the historic um, asset, the, the historic building. Um, but at the back, there's quite a large timber-framed extension with wood fibre insulation as well as wall insulation to the cottage without loss of detail um, that was listed. 
Again, I can talk about this in more detail later. And the third project um, is called William's Den. It's a new leisure building uh, and conversion of listed barns at North Cave. Those of you who have young children or grandchildren uh, may have visited. It's a fantastic um, example of rural diversification whereby the existing listed buildings were converted and were used, as those of you who have been there know, as uh, restaurant facilities, um, shop, um, and a new, a new play barn, um, which has a, a huge story to tell I could talk about all day. But basically, um, it was designed as a, straw, a large straw bale structure, um, but there were certain... Um, complications at the beginning between the straw bale subcontractor and the main contractor and unfortunately it ended up this building being the, the play barn in a steel frame um, but we were fortunate that the sustainability credentials of the building were not all lost because we then built the walls from um, hemp line blocks um, and wood fibre elsewhere so that's just to give you a, just a little taste of some of the projects we do and the range. So I'm going to finish up, and this is, this is my little bit of twist, um, in telling you about some research we carried out. And we, we, because in a, we're a small practice, you know, um, and we don't have money like some bigger companies do to carry out research to, 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 to say to people, we know this works and we have these these facts. Um, I went to a talk on campus and heard an amazing um, professor, Nick Carslaw, and she was giving a talk about the effects of cleaning and cooking on the indoor air quality. And I approached Nick and I said, well, I'm also interested in indoor air quality because I think we spend something like, again, this may not be the right number, but I think we spend between 80 and 90 percent of our time indoors in our homes, at work. And it's very important that you know, the indoor environment is healthy, the best it can be. We spend very little time outside now, which is another conversation. Anyway, so the University of York helped us um, through um, the Santander Bank, who fund a lot of University of York. I don't know the details. They helped us with a student, um, and then we used um, University of York equipment and laboratory testing to verify our claims and boasts about the wonderful effects of natural materials on indoor air quality. Um, so, um, just to sum up on this slide, we collaborated with the Department of Environment and Geography. Um, they had this equipment that we took into about 15 buildings, and basically, um, these canisters, I think they're about 15 litres, were taken into each of our buildings. And depending whether it was a residential project or a commercial project, uh, the report, I've got copies you can read, um, independent report, they would, they would, the testing had to be, you know, have obviously a methodology. Um, and the results were published in a report. Um, again, I've got copies of that. Um, so, here we go. So, one of the most convincing results of this uh, research, the air testing, was the presence of BTEX gases. Again, I'm not a scientist, but I know where they come from. So, all of these really scary names, uh, some of them I can't pronounce. I'm told it's ethyl benzene like ethyl, uh, but benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and two types of xylene, um, which are present in household furniture and fittings and carpets and curtains and wallpapers, um, which we have no control over normally at all, which is, um, you know, again, another talk. Um, but um, it's not all gloomy because natural materials can, can help absorb some of these chemicals. And um, again, I've got the report, but prolonged chronic exposure to these compounds can affect the kidney, liver, blood systems, long-term exposure 
um, can lead to leukemia and cancer. You know, why people want to put plastic windows in their house with the off-gassing, you know, rooms where they've got young children and themselves. Um, the, the industry is not, um, you know, has not told the whole truth about some of the effects of the materials that are commonly used. Okay. So, I apologise for the small size of some of this text, and I have got <coughs> copies of these slides and copies of all the information. But basically, um, this slide is showing um, the testing we did of, 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 some, of all the commercial buildings. I think there's, um, sorry, there's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five buildings, five commercial buildings. One of them is our offices, um, uh, the granary, which was a non-designated, a non-listed traditional building that we retrofitted. And I have a case study again on my stand to show you. And the top slide, the top picture, is of a shop in Snaith, um, which was completely retrofitted. And the results of the test show that the building's using or where natural materials were present in the interior had the lowest concentration or zero amounts of these BTEC gases. In, in the residential projects, now this is a very interesting... Um, we, we had a client who, an experienced client who had done retrofitting projects on traditional buildings in North Yorkshire. And unlike yourself, with their retrofit, they did do exactly. They, they gutted, they, they left, it's a, it a three-story um, detached house. It's the top two slides are interior photos in Old Walk. And they were built in the 70s. And they were ripe for retrofitting, uh, but they went the, ex they went the extra mile. Um, and, but they said, Sally, you might not want to work with us because we've done this before and we know what we're doing and we don't want to use your natural materials. We want to use what we're familiar with. We want to create a passive house from our 70s detached building uh, and retrofitted passive houses are uh, a huge, um, you know, that, that they're producing retrofitted traditional buildings to passive house standards, which are very onerous, is, is, is obviously um, being carried out very frequently now. Um, so in their house, um, they wanted to use plastic insulation um, because they'd done it that way before. Whole house, heat recovery, mechanical ventilation. And what was found was that uh, very clearly in the research, their house is the... Um, The blue, I haven't got my pointer with me, but this blue bar here shows, compared with um, a, a traditional building retrofit, a cottage, and the benchmark. So it's, we're looking at all these gases in this building using what would be common plastic insulation materials. And it had the highest concentration of BTEX gases. So, to some extent, it's all about choice, and it's all about education as well. And uh, I can do, if I'm asked, whatever kind of retrofit someone wants me to do, and they will all save carbon. They will all save energy, because you have to think fabric first at the beginning of the project. But there are other consequences of retrofit that I think are really important. And again, bear in mind that we're spending all this time indoors. We want the air that we're breathing to be the best quality we can. So I hope that was okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>